I was an awkward kid. Now some of you are already flashing knowing smiles because you know that it's true and you know that I embrace awkwardness. I embrace it so much that a former boss almost gave me an award for it. And yes, she used to give fake awards for fun. Now in an ideal world, we'd all be in a room together and I could do a poll to ensure that everyone was engaged. But it's 2020. We're clearly not in the same room together. While pets were winners this year, in-person conferences were not. So we'll do this on the honor system. Raise your hands if you gave yourself an awkward haircut as a kid. Guessing we're around 40%. Now raise your hands if you received an awkward haircut as a kid that still haunts you to this day. Awesome, we doubled it. Now for those that don't remember their own awkward haircuts, raise your hands if you know someone who knows someone that received an awkward haircut as a kid. And just like that, we're at 100% participation. Now, based on an informal, non-statistical survey of friends that I would never rely on as an auditor, I'm guessing most of these haircuts took place between maybe preschool and early elementary school. Not mine. I was 11 years old in that picture. I was a preteen getting ready to enter middle school, and it was shortly before we took these family photos. Now, no one in my family remembers this incident, and when I reminded them of it, one person even tried to convince me that I did this as a fashion statement. But I know the truth. I know that my math-loving but creatively challenged self struggled to cut in a straight line. And I just kept trying again and again without thinking about the consequences. So why do I share this story? Three reasons. The first is to encourage you to embrace awkwardness and vulnerability. They're part of the human condition so why not just embrace them? Why not share this amazing photo that I hated for most of my life with people to encourage them not to cut their hair during a pandemic or just for a drop of levity in a difficult year? The second reason I share this is just to acknowledge the obvious. We're in uncharted territory. 2020 has impacted everything from how we work to how we socialize to even how we cut our hair. Numbers are rising in many places and the health risks are still very real. And then there's also economic uncertainty, food insecurity, housing insecurity. The amount of insecurity and just general uncertainty this year, it's a lot. The third reason I share this is to introduce the concept of the right thing at the right time. Now cutting your hair at three, four, five, six, even seven years old, that might be considered cute and normal. Cutting your hair during a pandemic, when salons are closed or you just don't wanna take the risk, that could be considered normal, though not advised. But cutting your hair at 11 years old, just before family photos and just before entering middle school, that is not the right thing at the right time. Let's apply this concept to our work. Are we doing the right work at the right time? Think about our landscape this year versus a year ago. How have our stakeholders been impacted by the pandemic? Think Congress, the agencies we serve, the people, the general public that we serve, the grantees, the housing authorities, the banks, and the beneficiaries, the people. How have their needs changed? And how can we be more agile to meet those needs? So to talk more about those things, I'm gonna tell you more about my agency and a little more about myself. I work for HUD OIG, Housing and Urban Development. When the CARES Act was passed, we did what everyone watching did. We tried to quickly understand the provisions that were relevant to our work and establish a short oversight plan. We then issued several fraud bulletins that covered a variety of topics, everything from how to protect yourself to fraud, from fraud, to maintaining an ethical environment, and identifying common procurement schemes. We did these based on years of experience to get information out to our stakeholders quickly. We also started three assignments that were related to homeowners and renters. They all touch on a theme of communication. The first was looking at loan servicer websites and the information they made available to borrowers about CARES Act protections. The second was looking at HUD's response to inquiries from these same borrowers and others about the protections. And the third, this was our group's assignment, 
was looking at HUD's, HUD's communication to renters about the eviction moratorium in Section 4024 of the Act. Now, when compared to the dozens of audits I've done over the years and those I've watched my colleagues do, these assignments don't sound particularly noteworthy or groundbreaking. But when I think about the right work at the right time, they feel more relevant and timely. In times of great disruption and uncertainty, information is queen. People need access to clear and complete information about their rights and about the different protections available to them. Now, I'm not gonna cover the details and results of these assignments, but needless to say, we found issues with HUD's communication and servicer communication. I've included a slide that has information about those assignments and has links that take you to the fraud bulletins. So how did we decide to do several assignments related to communication? Three things come to mind. The first was an increase in cross-component communication. The second was channeling our own uncertainty. And the third was a push towards doing more agile work. I'm going to tell two stories about cross-component communication. The first is fairly informal. About a month after the CARES Act was passed, someone in the front office reached out to me. They heard I was doing some research related to the eviction protections, and they wanted to know more. Now, in reality, my team wasn't doing work on this yet, but we were doing work that was adjacent to it. So I offered to do research and then to meet with him to brainstorm. The problem is that when my colleague and I tried to find information related to the eviction protections, we had a hard time. The information we found was confusing and it was incomplete at best. We started to think about the people who would be up at 2 a.m. in the morning thinking about and wondering what their options were. Once we had that thought, there was no looking back. When we met with the front office to brainstorm, we brought up the fact that we had trouble finding information and that we thought renters would have that same trouble finding information for themselves. We suggested that we do this as an assignment, that we look at HUD's communication to renters. The rest is history. Now, the second conversation was more formal. Another team was getting ready to start work related to HUD's response to inquiries from borrowers and others at its FHA Resource Center. Now this work wasn't COVID-19 specific because the pandemic hadn't started yet. But by the time the proposal was being discussed at our cross-component engagement board meeting, the pandemic had started. This led to a discussion about how maybe we could make the assignment COVID-19 specific. It would also then complement the work that was being done by my team and by our Office of Evaluations. Again, the rest is history. Now these conversations might not sound noteworthy, but the thing you don't know is that they might not have happened two years ago. Back in 2018, the Office of Audit had a pretty well-defined planning process and it was working for us. However, HUD OIG as a whole was fairly siloed in its planning process. For example, we had cross-component planning meetings, but in reality, we would each go off into our own components audit, investigations, evaluations, legal, etc., and do our planning there, then come back and discuss what we had planned. These days, we do more cross-component planning throughout the year in both small groups and in large meetings. We brainstorm and discuss proposals together. Now, is it possible that we would have eventually done this work on our own without these cross-component discussions? Absolutely. But I believe these discussions led to us starting that work sooner and when we did it, we knew we had the backing of the entire agency in our front office. That's huge. The second thing I believe led to our work on communication was channeling our own uncertainty. Now I might've glossed over how monumental the planning changes were in our agency. It was a big shift and big organizational changes are hard and they take time. I remember at the beginning of our journey, two people from other agencies came to talk to us about their own journeys. One of them shared how it had taken two years to get to their new normal, and that really they felt like they were still getting there. I hope that wouldn't be true, but it is. When you are having hundreds of people process changes, it takes time. As a colleague said, even if you're drinking the Kool-Aid, it takes time to turn the ship. We're a big organization. People need time to process things internally. They need to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
A job that you've held for 15 years might suddenly feel foreign because while the essence of the job hasn't changed, a lot of the processes have. As one colleague said, it felt like he had taken on a whole other job, that managing the changes and processing everything and just thinking about it all the time was just a whole additional job. I identify with that feeling. Now, I don't say all of this to be negative, but simply to acknowledge the discomfort and vulnerability that come with change. Now, in addition to all of these changes that we were going through as an agency, of course, then the pandemic started and we were impacted just like everyone else. Now, my team is primarily located in New York and New Jersey, which were two of the areas that were hit hard first. I don't think it's a coincidence that we ended up doing work on communication. I believe that we channeled the uncertainty that we felt going through all these huge changes and the uncertainty we felt dealing with the pandemic like everyone else and that we channeled those into this work. I believe they helped us empathize with the hunger for information and certainty out there. The third thing that I believe helped lead to our work on communication was a push towards being more agile. Now in the months leading up to the pandemic, we had already had this discussion starting at Huddle IG. We'd been talking about ways we could serve our stakeholders better. Congress has always wanted our work quickly and we've always aimed to get that work into their hands so that they can make decisions. And of course, doing quicker work or different types of work could help other stakeholders as well. So we'd been talking about fraud bulletins, white papers, shorter assignments, all sorts of things. Now in the Office of Audit, we hadn't yet figured out what that all would look like before the pandemic hit. But we'd done enough discussing that when the ideas of doing this communication work came about, we decided to go for it. Being the first is sometimes hard, but we learned a lot by the end. One thing that helped my team was doing a deep dive into the Yellow Book. Now the Yellow Book contains lots of requirements for performance audits, a whole chapter. It talks about how you plan your work and supervise it, how you perform it, the types of evidence you gather, your findings, how you report on your work and how you document it. it covers everything. One thing that is focused on a lot is objectives. Depending on how you define your objective, certain standards in that chapter might be relevant and, sig and significant, or they might not be. Now, objectives can vary widely. Most commonly, we think of compliance audits. Did they follow ABC? But of course, there are other types of objectives. You can look at internal controls or the three E's, effectiveness, economy, and efficiency. And of course, you can have a wide scope or a narrow scope for your objectives. Now, one thing that we noticed the Yellow Book specifically mentions is that an objective can also be to look at the status of a program or a condition of a program. And don't let the word program throw you off. It can mean a lot of things, not just a whole program you know, that your agency has. It can also mean a process or a policy or a function. It can mean lots of things. I wanna talk about findings, internal controls, and evidence. Now, when I say finding, you probably think of criteria, condition, cause, and effect or impact. The Yellow Book says that we only need to develop those portions that are relevant and necessary to address our objective. It specifically opines that for objectives that are to address the, to look at the status or condition of a program, you might only need to develop the condition. So let me say that again, depending on your objective, if it's the type of objective we've been talking about, you might only need to develop the condition and not the other elements of the finding. Now to internal controls, everyone's favorite subject. The thing I wanna mention here is that it's important to think about whether or not internal controls are significant to your objective, because that's what determines whether you do internal control work. For objectives that are only to look at the status or condition of a program, and when you're not developing the cause of a finding, you might not need to do internal control work. Last, I wanna talk about evidence. Now we're always required to develop sufficient appropriate evidence to address our objective and to support our findings and conclusions. But keep in mind that the Yellow Book specifically opines that for the type of objective we're discussing, you need to do enough work that you know that what you're saying is accurate and reliable and that you're not omitting anything significant. The reward for sticking with me through that is seeing that my dad also had an amazing hairdo when I was a kid, a perm. 
and that I once wore a pack rat shirt on a motorcycle. I want to share one final story. It's a combination mea culpa and personal growth story. Now I've read the yellow book. I've taken training on it. I've applied it to my work and I've even taught training related to it. Back in 2011 and 2012, a colleague and I developed a HUD OIG specific training class for new auditors in charge. One of the modules that I worked on was about defining workable objectives. We talked about the different types of audit objectives, how specific we made them, and whether they were answerable. What we didn't talk about were objectives that were to look at the current status or condition of a program. That's right, the type of audit objective I just talked about. Here's what I wanna say. When I was developing that training module, I was doing it through the lens of my own personal experience. And at that time, the majority of the work I'd done was compliance audits. It's important to recognize that we can grow. And the past year has reminded me that making strategic changes to be more agile and better meet stakeholder needs is key to leadership. So here are today's takeaways. The first thing, embrace vulnerability and awkwardness. Embrace the human side of change and disruption. The second, think about the right work at the right time. Aim for it. And the third, push yourself to be more agile. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the forum.